especially after what, what happened with Russia last year, where uh, a number of countries froze uh, their, their central bank reserves. It got me thinking about if you've got a central bank, they're kind of worried about this type of risk, then uh, potentially they might want to acquire a, a decent amount of cryptocurrency. Do you think that there are any countries who likely have already done this and just not revealed it? All right, guys, bang, bang. I've got Matthew here with me. Uh, Matthew, you recently published in November a uh, paper that is titled Hedging Sanctions Risk Cryptocurrency and Central Bank Reserves. And this paper got whipped around the internet, obviously by a lot of Bitcoiners, but also I saw quite a bit of conversation coming from traditional finance and even people who uh, would fancy themselves kind of central bank experts. Um, maybe we could just start with uh, why someone from the, departments, uh, the Department of Economics at Harvard would even be interested in the intersection of central banks and something like Bitcoin. Where did that interest come from and kind of what put you down this path? Yeah, so um, first of all, thank you for having me on your podcast. It's always fun to, to have an opportunity to talk, talk about my research, especially with an audience as big as yours. <laughs> um, I think actually I, I got into this topic not through the crypto angle, but rather through the sanctions angle. So I was thinking about, I've sort of long been interested in, in the effects of, of sanctions on the international financial system. And uh, especially after what, what happened with Russia last year, where uh, a number of countries froze uh, their, their central bank reserves, it got me thinking about you know, one, of the, one of the effects of this might be that central banks might think about uh, reallocating their reserves, sort of in anticipation of, 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 uh, of this type of risk, sort of trying to protect themselves from it. And um, and so, you know, kind of logically following from that, so the question you want to ask yourself is, well, what could they buy that would protect themselves from this type of risk? Um, obviously, gold, uh, at least if you have physical custody of it, uh, would would be one potential answer. And but but I think uh, Bitcoin might be might be another. And so that that was where the paper came from, sort of exploring whether. Um, Bitcoin can serve as either a substitute or a complement for gold uh, in, in, in that sense. Um, yeah. So what's fascinating with the latest round of U.S. sanctions uh, in the Russia-Ukraine conflict is the United States has been using financial sanctions for a long time now uh, against a number of different countries. But I think that there was a uh, fairly widespread belief that these sanctions, both the speed and the severity of them, kind of signaled a new regime or a new paradigm of financial sanctions. There was the freezing of central bank assets. There was a, kind of a global coordinated effort. Talk a little bit about the actual use of sanctions and kind of how you evaluate, you know, maybe their historical use, but then also what's your take on uh, these sanctions against Russia and, and how severe they were and, and kind of the global coordination that was used to actually implement them? Yeah, so I mean, I, so my paper doesn't uh, estimate like the, the, uh, the impact of sanctions on the Russian economy per se, but it certainly seems that, that they've had some effect. Uh, we've the, the Western world has sanctioned Russia's imports more than its exports, so uh, that really causes them some major supply chain issues when 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 it comes to trying to manufacture and, and build stuff. Um, I, I think what makes this this an interesting topic is that when, when it comes to these these sanctions, there's not just one thing that can get you sanctioned. So obviously, in the case of Russia, the, the sanctions were applied because they invaded a neighboring country. Uh, but there are other central banks that have also had their reserves frozen by the U.S. for a variety of other reasons, ranging from building nuclear weapons to uh, terrorism-related concerns to just having a government that the U.S. doesn't recognize, like uh, Venezuela, for example. Um, so, well, and also, which, you know, maybe the human rights-related concerns thrown in there, too. But, but um, there's just kind of this grab bag of, of, of things. Uh, and, and that's what makes it interesting is that uh, uh, there's, there's not just one thing. And, and, the other, and the other thing too is the sanctions are up to the US president and um, Congress can overrule uh, the, the imposition of sanctions, but that would take a two thirds majority to do that. So uh, really, if you're thinking about um, as a central bank, if you're thinking about holding uh, assets in, in the United States, you got to ask yourself how much you trust the U.S. president. 
when you see the sanctions, I think for me, someone who does not spend a lot of time studying sanctions, even studying maybe central bank uh, kind of chess moves, if you will, in the geopolitical stage, uh, the thing that surprised me was the freezing of assets that were not in the actual sovereignty of the nation, right? So these are uh, dollars or other foreign currencies that are being stored outside of Russia. Uh, there were gold reserves being stored outside of Russia. I believe that there was another situation where Venezuela's gold was stored at like the Bank of England, if I remember correctly. Yep. And there was uh, the um, kind of uh, rejection of Venezuela's request to return their gold to them. And so it became very obvious to me, like you would think the central bank would have the national assets at the central bank, but then it kind of highlighted like, no, that's not how this works. And so how common is it for there to be sanctions on these assets that are not held within the country? Yeah. So, well, first of all, let's, let's get to how, how common is it that, that countries store assets outside of their own borders? Uh, it, it's relatively common. Um, and it really gets actually this sort of tension between uh, like what are the benefits of having a centralized financial system versus a decentralized one? Well, in a centralized system, uh, you have lower transaction costs because you have these central clearinghouses that can facilitate transactions. Uh, you know, a good example of that being the New York Fed. So they, in the in the vaults of the New York Fed, uh, are quite a bit of gold uh, that belongs to about 36 different uh, international organizations and, and central banks. And it, it's nice. The, the benefit to them is that there's low transaction costs. Well, first of all, because the New York Fed kind of handles the custody and the security of it and all that. But also, if they, if one of those countries wants to transact with another uh, country that also got their gold at the New York Fed, um, then some staff from the New York Fed will literally just take the gold bars off of one shelf in the vault and move them to the other shelf. And, uh, and so it, it's just very easy to, to, to conduct transactions. On the other hand, yeah, you, then, you know, once you once you store your assets outside of your own borders, yeah, I mean, you, you do have to ask yourself the question of, are they going to be returned if I want them? And, um, yeah, you're right that, that Venezuela has, has had a dispute with, with the Bank of England, which, as far as I'm aware, they've pretty much lost. So, so the, the British courts have not um, uh, given Venezuela any, any relief in terms of repatriating its, its gold. Um, so yeah, I mean, and I, I think that that in in general, um, uh, you know, th there's also just the fact that the the traditional sort of Western financial system is well regulated and stable, and so that also makes it an attractive place to store and 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 custody assets. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I think it's I think it's quite common that that. Uh, uh, you know, people would store uh, in institutions would, would have accounts uh, outside of their home borders. When I think about Venezuela asking the Bank of England for their gold back, um, one, yeah. I'm imagining that the British courts uh, have an issue with uh, Venezuelan government, human rights, all the things that, you know, probably the U.S. also uh, would take object to. Um, but also there's this element of if we tell them to kick rocks and we say you're not getting your gold back, they can't really do anything. And if you kind of compare that to, you know, maybe the United States, if a country somewhere in the world said to the United States, you're not getting your gold back, uh, we got a pretty powerful, swift and effective military. And it feels like we actually could do something. Now, whether we did or not would be up for debate and the details of that situation. And so is there this element also of not just – uh, which country it is and human rights and stuff, but also just like if you don't have a really strong military, then like you kind of uh, are at a disadvantage and countries know that. Yeah, uh, so, so that, that's, that's an interesting uh, point. And I, I do believe that, that in some of the military uh, conflicts, like in, in Europe, for example, in the, the 19th century, that uh, – like one of the motivations for conquering uh, another country was was to acquire its gold reserves for yourself. Uh, and so, yeah, I mean, I mean, I think historically maybe that that's been a motivation or one motivation anyway for for conflict. Um, you know, in, in your example, it's sort of it's actually asymmetric because I, I don't think the U.S. stores any of its gold outside of its own borders. They so would never have a situation where a country would be refusing to give uh, the U.S.'s gold back to itself. Um, but yeah, no, that, that, I mean, you are, you are right that uh, in terms of, you know, Venezuela, if the, if the British courts don't 
you know, released to Venezuela, but there's not a whole lot they can they can do. <laughs> Yeah, it, it's uh, it's crazy to think about. And so if we then take like the Venezuela example, and maybe we just extend that out to the Russian uh, situation, uh, it seems very similar. Like Russia had a bunch of foreign currencies, uh, gold, uh, other assets that were on their central bank balance sheet. They had them stored elsewhere. And it seems like this, although likely was led by the U.S., uh, it was NATO. It was kind of this global coordination. And many countries decided all at once that they were going yep. to freeze assets and, and kind of cut Russia off from this global financial system. Once that occurs, is it the belief that like we've breached kind of this new paradigm and therefore this will become the playbook? I kind of think of it like uh, the 2008 global financial crisis. QE uh, becomes all the rage. And now it seems like every time we have some sort of market downturn, people start talking immediately about QE and QE is like the new normal. Yeah. Is that how you see this playing out with sanctions? Um, there may be some element of that in the sense that there's a, maybe a, um, uh, a tendency or, or a, uh, yeah, a tendency for, for politicians to reach for sanctions as a tool because they're, they're perceived as, I mean, it, look, it sort of looks good, like like they have, a, like you, you can go in the press and say, oh, you know, we're doing something about this bad situation. Like, look at this big sanctions package we're unveiling. And you can unveil many of them, right? So like you can step them up and step them down. But at the same time, you don't have to actually commit military resources to addressing uh, whatever uh, uh, issue is, is going on that's, that's the, the root cause of, of the sanctions. So. Maybe you know, in a, in a world where military conflict is is very expensive, and where countries are maybe more, at least a little bit more inclined towards isolationism, perhaps at least there are political movements towards towards that regard. Uh, these these sanctions do seem to be kind of like a very appealing um, alternative. And uh, so, yeah, I mean, I, I I don't necessarily know that I would call it like a new paradigm, but I think it is maybe sort of a continuation of a, of a trend. Um. Got it. And, and what's fascinating about Russia on, on just the sanctions part, um, I actually tweeted this a couple of days ago, is I saw a graphic that showed the imports of all goods between February and August of 2021. So kind of February being yeah. the time when Russia invaded Ukraine. And the fact that EU trade with Russia on a whole increased in 2022 uh, despite the sanctions. So I'm sorry, February to August of 2022. Now, the nuance there is that commodity prices were highly volatile. And so in yep. dollar or euro uh, euro terms, there's actually been an increase from 21 to 22 uh, with EU country in, um, going ahead and exporting into Russia or Russian imports. Um, and so what that told me was like, forget for a second uh, the nuances of importing and exporting and, and dollar changes of the commodity prices and all that. It's just that sanctions on imports and exports are very, very hard to have the intended consequences because the economy is like this big complex machine. But in contrast, if your gold's in my custody and I say you don't get it back, I'm very direct in the, in the kind of uh, impact that I want to have. You don't get the gold, right? So that sanction almost feels like it's easier to actually have uh, control over and, and implement then maybe playing games with the nuances of imports and exports and dollar values and, and various commodities. Yeah, I think, I think that's right. Um, I think there, I think whenever there's, uh, when, when a country tries to country a tries to prevent country B from, let's say importing good X, uh, if country B really wants it, they can look around the world and find other people who are willing to sell it from and maybe they have to pay a higher price for it. But, uh, yeah, I mean, as long as there's an economic incentive there, uh, you know, it seems that uh, that that they probably will find some where there's a will, there's a way. <laughs> um, you know, I mean, also, you know, maybe a good example that countries like uh, Turkey, where they're kind of uh, turning maybe a bit of a blind eye to enforcing these sanctions, and so there's a lot of uh, business getting set up there where they're they're essentially acting as middlemen uh, between. Um, uh, Firms like let's say in Europe who can't who don't want to export directly to Russia, but uh, they can export to Turkey, and then the Turks will you know just move stuff onward. Um, so yeah, yeah. 
That makes sense. And so in the paper that you wrote, again, the title of it was uh, Hedging Sanctions Risk, Cryptocurrency and Central Bank Reserves. Um, you had this data point uh, early on where you say that from 2016 to 2021, countries facing a higher risk of U.S. sanctions increased the gold share of their reserves more than countries facing a lower risk of U.S. sanctions. And really, I think what you're trying to get at there is countries are not dumb. They know who's at higher risk and lower risk, and therefore they were almost pre uh, um, or, or kind of in anticipation trying to become more resilient with the central bank reserves. Is that correct? That's, that's the argument I make. Yeah. Now, I, I can't necessarily rule out that uh, countries facing a higher risk of sanctions, which, by the way, I proxy for that based on where they're getting their military imports from. Because uh, I, I can't like compute exactly what a country's risk of sanctions is. I don't, I don't think there's really a way to do that. Um, but I can like try to find some other variable that's that's probably correlated with it. And uh, yeah, and I can't necessarily uh, rule out that there the the countries that are getting more of their military imports from Russia and China, and therefore at a higher risk of U.S. Uh, sanctions, that they're increasing their gold reserves uh, because maybe just because of political considerations, like they find it distasteful to hold U.S. Treasury. So it's not necessarily that they're explicitly considering the risk of sanctions. It might be that they're just making a political decision, sort of a political statement. Um, so I can't, I can't necessarily rule that out. But certainly, uh, yeah, the, the evidence is, is consistent with uh, the notion that central banks are at least starting to, to think about this. Uh, interesting data point also is that um, uh, last uh, the last couple quarters of, of uh, 2022, there were some big uh, gold purchases by by central banks, uh, I think, including China's. So, um, yeah, and it is, it's happening. The paper, in the way that I read it, I think came to kind of three conclusions. Um, and uh, you basically make the argument on the first point that if sanctions risk uh, exists or is increasing, that would diminish the appeal of U.S. Treasuries. So I think that historically central banks have held U.S. Treasuries. Your kind of first conclusion or first point is really the fact that like they may get rid of those because of that sanction risk. Explain a little bit more if a country is holding a large portion of their central bank reserves in U.S. Treasuries, what the potential damage could be if they come under the scrutiny and potential sanctions of the United States. Yeah, well, I mean, then they lose access. So if they happen to be sanctioned, then they lose access to that that portion of their reserves. They can't touch that money. You know, it's sort of like uh, it's almost as if it's it's been destroyed. <laughs> I mean, because because really the, the value of money is in is in the ability to exchange it for something. So if if, I, if you have an account that has uh, fifty billion dollars in it, but you can't you can't touch it, you can't withdraw it, you can't deposit it into it, you can't do anything with it. it it's kind of useless to you. It's almost as if you didn't even have that that money. Um, so uh, yeah, I mean, so so it's it, it's it's quite uh, quite pernicious. And and yeah, so the the, the conclusion is is that um, this this risk, even at relatively low levels, uh, has potentially substantial effects on on the. Uh, portfolio uh, sort of allocation decision of, of a central bank. And so really what it does is it, it, it kind of takes uh, treasuries, which are traditionally thought of as being a sort of safe haven risk-free asset, and it turns them into a risky asset. Um, so it doesn't mean you wouldn't necessarily buy any of them. And, and there are many other reasons why you might like them too. I mean, they're very liquid. Uh, there are swap lines, for example, you can set up with, with the Federal Reserve, uh, so, so there are there are nice things you can do with these things for for a central bank, but but um, yeah, I mean, with with this risk of sanctions, they sort of turn into they turn from a risk free asset to a risky asset, and it's it's uh, so it's yeah, I mean, it changes it changes the nature of treasuries. The second conclusion that you come to is that a increased risk of sanctions would propel broader diversification in central bank reserves. So one is like, okay, the U.S. treasuries themselves may become less attractive, but also central banks may think about forget any one asset. We just need broad diversification to kind of increase the resiliency. Explain that a little bit more. Yeah, that's right. Well, so as long as as long as uh, the the risk of sanctions is sort of imperfectly correlated, which is to say that. Um, you know, in the case of Russia, the U.S. is pretty good about going all around the world and, and getting, you know, a large number of countries to, to freeze the reserves. And not just NATO, by the way, but also Japan and Australia, uh, New Zealand and, and a number of other, I think even South Korea. Um, so, so 
you know, in the case of Russia, it was, I guess, almost perfectly correlated. But but as long as it, it's not it's not perfectly correlated, that there's a chance that some countries might sanction you and some may not, then there's an incentive to, to, to really diversify so that uh, in the event you get hit with sanctions by some countries, you might still have a portion of your reserves accessible uh, in other countries that didn't sanction you. And then the last thing that you conclude is that that increase in sanctions risk could bolster the long run fundamental value of both cryptocurrency and gold. And so we already talked about yeah. gold as something that central banks are adding. Talk a little bit about cryptocurrency as a whole, and then you specifically single out Bitcoin in the paper uh, a number of times yeah. and kind of talk about why you think that could become one of these like imperfect substitutes. Hey guys, I hope that you're enjoying this interview. Before we continue, I wanna quickly remind you, I'm hosting a conference March 4th at the Miami Beach Convention Center. That's right, it's a big venue for a big event. On March 4th, I'm bringing together some of the absolute fan favorite guests from the podcast and this show, and we're gonna debate ideas. The event is called Lyceum Miami. The Lyceum was the public gymnasium in Athens, Greece. That ancient gymnasium was important because it's a place where people from all walks of life came together to have a war of ideas. You were able to not only participate in the debates, but also people could sit and watch some of the smartest people in the world talk about important issues. That's what we're gonna be doing on March 4th at the Miami Beach Convention Center. If you wanna join us, go to lyceummiami.com or click on the link in the description and I'd love to see you there. Okay, let's get back to this conversation. Yeah, so um, the, the paper really thinks about uh, cryptocurrency, and, and so let me actually start with the, the, the second part of your question, which is sort of why, why Bitcoin? Um, Bitcoin is by far the largest uh, cryptocurrency, and Bitcoin and uh, Ether combined are like 70% of the uh, market value of all cryptocurrencies. So, um, you know, just looking at, at Bitcoin uh, gives you a pretty good proxy for the sort of the whole uh, non-stablecoin cryptocurrency market. And non-stablecoin is kind of important here because stablecoins don't really help you if you're worried about sanctions because um, U.S. dollar coin and Tether can, can be sanctioned. Uh, and, I, and because of the way they hold U.S. dollar collateral, they can probably be uh, bullied by the U.S. government into implementing uh, sanctions if that's really what the government wanted to go down that, that path. Uh, so really, when it comes to, to cryptocurrency, it's, it's got to be sort of the the uh the the fiat uh, so the fiat cryptocurrencies and it's got to be for a central bank it's got to be cryptocurrencies that are big you know where you can conduct potentially a billion dollar transaction let's say uh without you know having a massive impact on, on the market price uh bitcoin of course today is a lot smaller than it was when i first uh, started writing this paper i think it was you know like forty thousand dollars maybe around around the time that uh, the, the sanctions were applied to, to Russia, um, but it's still, you know, the market cap's what, 300 billion, something around there. So, so it, it's um, plenty big enough to, to conduct, uh, uh, you know, not transactions of non, non-trivial size. Um, as far as the fundamental value is concerned, I think there are a lot of use cases for cryptocurrency that involve just transacting and sort of like you exchange fiat currency for uh, crypto let's say you then send the crypto as a remittance to, to somebody somewhere else in the world. And then that person swaps the crypto for another type of fiat currency. So that type of transaction is not really going to contribute to, to a fundamental value because it's just buying and, and then reselling. So the real question when it comes to fundamental value is who's going to be holding on to this stuff? And this paper kind of conceives of, of cryptocurrency as, as being a form of insurance. Um, Holding on to it gives you insurance against the possibility of uh, you facing sanctions and having a large portion of your wealth sort of potentially destroyed. Um, and in that scenario, you still have these these digital assets and also maybe gold. Uh, and and so that 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 generates the incentive then to hold on to this stuff, uh, sort of to protect yourself. And so that that's the sense in which it's it's insurance. When you think of Bitcoin specifically being added, 
Is your expectation that central banks would um, buy the asset and let's say they're able to acquire you know, a large portion uh, in, in dollar terms of uh, Bitcoin, have you gone deep enough down the rabbit hole to start thinking about like how they would custody it? Are they putting it on like hardware devices and they're like holding it in a vault somewhere? Are they like creating their own, you know, cryptocurrency custody solution? Like, how do you just yeah. think about uh, something that is, um, I think, to the Bitcoin and crypto crowd, very native to them and they understand. But yeah. to a nation state or a central bank, it's very different than custodying almost any other type of asset. Yeah, that, that's right. Um, and certainly like the FTX uh, case illustrates that, uh, you know, just another example of how it's important to choose your custodian wisely. Um, I think that a central bank would almost certainly want to self-custody its, its Bitcoin. They might rely on exchanges to make the initial purchases, but uh, this, I don't see any reason why they would want to take the risk of, of uh, you know, having an exchange blow up and lose access to a large amount of, of, of cryptocurrency. Uh, so yeah, I think they would have some kind of self custody solution. Now, what you know exactly what that looks like, I I, I haven't sort of delved into the the details of that. Um, but yeah, I I think they would want to keep it off the balance sheet of some other uh, you know sort of corporate entity that uh, potentially uh, maybe not not as not that stable. Um, yeah, I mean this, this question of, uh, of of exchanges is sort of another interesting one more, more broadly, and it, it's definitely something that, that the crypto community has got to figure out. Um, yeah, and and what I think becomes kind of fascinating to me is also in some way you are mitigating one risk, which is U.S. Treasuries or sanctions risk. At the same time, uh, we know that Bitcoin is a bearer asset, and you are yeah. increasing the like honeypot or the target of malicious actors around the world. Now, all of a sudden, you're almost increasing the financial reward for a uh, adversarial uh, nation state or adversarial group to hack your central bank and be able to somehow get custody of the asset. And again, how you custody it may determine whether that's a real risk or not or whatever. But in some ways, it almost feels like you're mitigating one risk, but you may be increasing another. Is that true? Or, or do you think that nation yeah. states would figure out a way to kind of mitigate both? Yeah, no, actually, I think that's absolutely true. Uh, and so the, the paper doesn't think of cryptocurrency as being a sort of a free lunch at all. I mean, it is it is very much uh, optimizing by trying to sort of balance your exposure to uh, different different risks. Now, the, the risk you just pointed out about uh, sort of custody risk and uh, sort of the implications of self custody as far as uh, cybersecurity. Um, there's also, of course, the risk if you're self custodying that you, you lose access to your wallet. Uh, you know, you, you're kind of up a creek. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, yeah. So, so those are absolutely things they would have to think about very, very carefully. Um, uh, the other thing I would say, though, so this paper thinks more about, uh, actually, more about sort of the price volatility and sort of trading that off versus the risk of, of sanctions. Um, uh, that's another that's another area where you're sort of optimizing these these risks where you're if you're adding Bitcoin to your reserves, you're adding an asset that's much more volatile than than uh, the exchange rates of fiat currencies. But on the other hand, it, it does also have this type of insurance value. So um, that's that's kind of the trade off that, that the paper is thinking about. Yeah. And w one of the other pieces of this uh, that it gets into is I'll call it like the game theory. So if all of a sudden a major uh, country in the world decided to go ahead and add Bitcoin to its central bank reserves and openly state it, right? So it was a known fact to the world. Does that then kind of kick off, hey, everyone's got to go buy it because you almost need a good defense um, and naturally a finite asset is going to go up in price if it, there's an increase in demand? Yeah. Like, how do you kind of think just about like maybe the repercussions of a major central bank somewhere in the world saying we are buying this and putting in our central bank reserves? Yeah, it's, it is an interesting question. Um, so certainly El Salvador is, is the sort of the, I, I think the one of, well, really one of two countries that hold Bitcoin, the other being Ukraine. I think they basically hold it because they've gotten donations, not because they actually went out and, and actively bought it. But but El Salvador certainly sort of went out and said, "Yeah, we're we're buying Bitcoin. Uh, here's what we're doing." I think their wallet, they made their wallets uh, publicly known, or at least some of them. Um, 
And, uh, and you know, of course, they, they got a lot of criticism and people saying, this is, this is crazy. Like, why, why are you doing this? Um, you know, you're just basically lighting money on fire, <laughs> which, of course, and, and I think they're, they're, the, the average price they paid for their Bitcoin is somewhere in the, like the 30 to 40K range. So, so they have lost a fair bit on, 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 on their Bitcoin in terms of the, the market price. Um, but, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, there is this interesting question of if you're going to buy Bitcoin, do you reveal it in, in the paper? I, I also talked about like, uh, does maybe not revealing it also makes you a little bit more resilient to sanctions because the U S treasury can certainly add cryptocurrency wallets onto its sanctions list. And that, that has sort of the force of law behind it. So as a U.S. person, you cannot lawfully transact with a cryptocurrency wallet that's on the U.S. sanctions list. And if you do, the, the penalties are, are quite severe, uh, like civil and criminal uh, penalties. Uh, so, but, but of course, the U.S. Treasury can't sanction something it doesn't know about. <laughs> so so uh, if, if central bank uh, you know, X uh, is, is buying Bitcoin and thinking about it as this type of insurance, then it seems that it might actually be better for them to just kind of do it quietly. Uh, a couple other points about that too are that, um, yeah, as you pointed out, if if if, uh, if a number of sort of number of larger central banks started announcing they were they were buying Bitcoin, uh, yeah, you'd think you probably would move the price up, and so they probably wouldn't like that because they'd rather buy Bitcoin when it's cheap than after they have moved the price up by announcing that they're doing it, right? So like, there's always there's never an incentive to tell the financial markets in advance what your plan is, right? It's like you always want to tell them after the fact. Uh, so you don't you don't move the prices uh, uh, before you trade. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. And when you start to really almost critically think about a nation state somewhere in the world doing this, is it fair to say it would be the nation states with the highest sanctions risk? Like El Salvador, I don't think has very high sanctions risk, at least when they started. They were doing it more from like a financial incentive standpoint, yeah. a uh, prosperity for their future citizens, um, or at least that was what the talk track was. Um, what you're talking about here is like people who almost are doing it at a necessity. Is that really the thought process of like the major countries are only going to do that of necessity? They're not going to go and uh, essentially speculate on the on the future price of a commodity. Yeah, so I think I think you're right that that uh, at least I, I never saw anything about El Salvador claiming that they were thinking about Bitcoin as a form of insurance, and I think that speculation is a very bad reason for anybody to purchase anything, <laughs> and that includes. Uh, just ordinary people and and central banks. I mean, it's it's supremely difficult to forecast uh, the prices of of financial assets. So, um, especially when you have something as as volatile as Bitcoin, I, I think if you're going to buy it. The reason really ought to be that you're buying it because it fills some particular need in your portfolio. There's something about the characteristics of it that are well aligned with the risks that you personally face as an investor rather than that you just think the price is going to go up because maybe it will, but maybe it won't. Right. So, um, uh, yeah, so, so yeah. So, and, 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 and along the, those veins, yes, the, the paper would suggest that certainly would suggest that, that the countries facing the highest risk of sanctions have the strongest incentive to, to think about, uh, acquiring some Bitcoin. Now, whether they want to or not is also going to be a function of, whether, for example, they feel like they can get enough gold. I mean, gold in the paper really emerges as the uh, sort of the premier or the primary or first choice for, for protecting yourself against this type of risk because it's just so much more stable than, than, than cryptocurrency. You know, it has a multi-thousand year history behind it. Um, so, uh, but but if, if you've got a central bank that, for example, doesn't have the capability of storing physical gold, like it doesn't have any vaults for doing that, um, and they think they're kind of worried about this type of risk, then uh, potentially they might want to acquire a, a decent amount of cryptocurrency. Yeah. Do you think that there are any countries around the world who likely have already done this and just not revealed it? Or is it too hard to kind of guess in, in terms of where we are from like a adoption standpoint of nation states and central banks? Yeah, I mean, of course, I, I I wouldn't know for sure, but I, it wouldn't surprise me at all if there are some that are doing it or not revealing it. Uh, there is actually some interesting evidence that countries tend to underreport their gold holdings. 
uh, 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 because they don't like having a report that they take, they've taken a loss on, on their gold uh, when the price drops. And, uh, and so if there's an incentive to do that for gold, then certainly there'd be a much stronger incentive to underreport cryptocurrency holdings, not only because they get exposed to criticism from kind of the more traditional finance community, but also because, uh, you know, they have this, it's, it's so much more volatile than, than, than gold. Uh, so they have this, this incentive to, to not reveal it for a number of reasons. First, they don't want to move the market price. Second, uh, there's this volatility that they don't necessarily want to have to explain away. Uh, and, um, uh, and then third, that not disclosing it really kind of maybe boosters the, the insurance value of, of having these, these, uh, decentralized tokens. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think there's, there's the incentives are there not to, to reveal it. And I also, I, I wouldn't be surprised also if there are some countries where they acquired some, uh, Bitcoin, let's say, but they're doing it through their sovereign wealth fund rather than through their central bank reserves. So there may also there may be just some accounting as to you know which entity they use to buy it or how they kind of keep it off the books so to speak. Um, but no, I mean it wouldn't it wouldn't surprise me at all. As you see these central banks, um, whether they are actually announcing it or not, whether they're buying it or not, one of the things I've been most surprised by is it seems like central bank digital currencies has gotten a ton of uh, momentum support. Uh, uh, a lot of mind share, a lot of papers. You, you just see like kind of the wheels are churning, right? Bitcoin seems to be the, uh, maybe the enemy. And maybe that's like an exaggeration, but like, it's very much like, no, not Bitcoin. Yes, this central bank digital currency is interesting. How much of that is, uh, they may not be educated or taking the time to understand Bitcoin versus these central banks are very educated and they kind of understand exactly what the pros and cons of a central bank digital currency, a Bitcoin and everything in between is, and they're kind of taking more of a uh, aspirational position in terms of what they hope happens versus, uh, you know, kind of uh, um, almost being ignorant to something like Bitcoin. Yeah. I mean, I don't think any central bank sort of wants to willingly just abandon kind of its job uh, as far as sort of facilitating fiat currency transactions is sort of guarding and safeguarding that that system uh, and then just sort of throw up their hands and say, okay, we give up and, you know, we think everybody should just start using crypto. So, uh, you know, it almost, there's almost like a sense of self-preservation here <laughs> that, it's, that uh, you know, they, they, they don't necessarily want uh, uh, to, to kind of just close up shop. But um, I mean, you know, the, the, the price volatility of Bitcoin is, is really quite quite problematic. I mean, you just can't run an economy on an asset that swings up and down, you know, five, 10 percent in a single day. It, it's just too, too much. Um, and and uh, and uh, uh, as far as the digital currencies, too, I mean, I think I think a lot of that is also more. Sort of technological, or as far as um, just thinking about kind of improving the plumbing of the financial system, like how are transactions settled and cleared, uh, things like that. Um, I mean, th those those are very important questions, and they, they do have implications for uh, financial stability, and um, so they're important to to understand. Um, but that's that's also why you know there's, I think there's a lot of ink getting spilled on on that. You mentioned earlier before we got started that uh, you had seen some of the past interviews I've done on Bitcoin and uh, some stuff we agree on, some stuff we don't agree on. Um, rather than uh, bore the audience and probably you and myself on the things we agree on, what are some of the things that uh, we di you, you believe we disagree on? Maybe we could kind of talk through those. Uh, and I'd love to learn you know, from, from your side and, and maybe uh, you could uh, stumble into one or two things uh, if I uh, put my foot in my mouth. Okay, sure. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, of course, just because we disagree on it doesn't mean uh, I'm right and you're wrong, right? I mean, we just, we just have a difference of opinion. Um, uh, I guess uh, maybe one of them we could talk about is, is that there's kind of this, I, I think there's this, this tension between the notion that uh, Bitcoin is, is sort of represents uh, free speech and that it's used for sort of legitimate purposes. Uh, you know, related to like furthering democracy and people's own, you know, free will and so forth. There's like a natural tension between that and then this notion that it's resistant against sanctions. Because if if the government 
uh, doesn't want you doing something, they're going to declare it illegal. And if you're going to do it anyway with Bitcoin, then you're breaking the law. So, uh, you know, I, I think that a part of, even if Bitcoin is not used to a great extent today uh, for, for the purpose of facilitating illegal activity, I mean, like, for example, the, um, there's an analytics firm called Chainalysis that looks at blockchain transactions and and they say that a pretty small portion of of, uh, of Bitcoin is is used in illegal activity. Now maybe maybe they're just not counting it correctly, but but I think that like if you're going to argue that the cryptocurrencies are not used for illegal things, uh, maybe that's not true. To, maybe that's true today, but you have to at least acknowledge that like an important aspect of them is that they could be. Like they could be used for that in the future, and and that actually is like an important part of what what gives them value. Like I like I was describing them as insurance. Um, now you can certainly argue whether uh, the government should be making certain things illegal or not, but the fact that you have the option of bypassing that, uh, you know, there is kind of that 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 tension there. Um, yeah. I, I think it's a, a very fair question. And if we separate out for a second uh, um, the illegal activities uh, from the legal activities, I think when people say that uh, Bitcoin is kind of like free speech codified, right? Uh, the first thing is um, in the United States, you have the right to free speech. Now, there are limitations around certain things, you know, yelling fire in a uh, movie theater, all, all of those types of things. But generally, if you're trying to uh, do good things or legal things, uh, you are allowed to say what you want. And, and uh, actually the true test of free speech is almost to protect the speech of the people you disagree with, right? But they're not uh, inciting violence or, or any of this stuff. And so um, what Bitcoin does, uh, which is unique for uh, money, is that it provides this censorship resistance, right? Now, what is censorship meant to be? What is it not meant to be? When is it appropriate? When is it not? That's definitely debated. And I think that gets more into like the legal and illegal transactions. But just from a technical basis, the fact that I can send Bitcoin to you and I don't need to ask permission from anyone else is uh, a technical innovation when it comes to uh, being able to use economic value, something with a market price and, and use for medium of exchange. So I think it's like pretty well accepted, uh, let's say on the technical basis of just like, there is this censorship resistance. You know, you mentioned uh, the insurance is a form of that censorship resistance uh, for the central banks, whatever. Now, when it gets into legal and illegal, I actually think most people look at uh, the illegal transactions and I always joke that like, yes, there are anarchists. Yes, there are like hardcore libertarians that believe like there should be no rules or laws or, or whatever. Um, but like generally, most people in a society agree on the illegal things that they should be illegal, right? If you are financing terrorism or, or whatever it is, uh, for the most part, I think the majority of these societies say, hey, we should not uh, allow that to happen. And, and it's good that we uh, prevent bad things from happening to to our citizens. Well, well wait a minute. Let, let, me, uh, let, let, me, uh, let me interrupt you just for a second. I mean, what about, for example, uh, protesting Canada's vaccination policy? I mean, uh, the, the government declared that illegal. And they they froze their banking out. So if they were, if any of those protesters were transacting in, in Bitcoin, they were breaking the law, right? So so the question is, um, but just because uh, the government makes it a law doesn't mean that it is a ethical law, right? And, and no, the example I, yeah. I always yeah. the the example I always use is like um, if they had done that in the United States, right? They would have violated the Constitution. Now, I'm not an expert on Canadian politics nor what their legal documents are. So like, maybe it's legal, maybe it's not, I'm not sure. But in the United States, if uh, the government had said, hey, we are basically going to remove you, we're going to eject you from the financial system because you are not complying with a, whether it's vaccination or, or any other law, uh, I think that there would have been a line out of the courtroom door of lawyers saying, hey, you know, you're violating people's uh, various constitutional rights. And so like, it's a very weird thing because in some ways, uh, without censorship resistant money, the default is the government's right, the individuals are wrong. When there is censorship resistant money, in my opinion, and again, this is just me individually, it kind of balances out the powers. And now all of a sudden it is the individual is right and the government, it, the burden of proof goes to the government that they broke the law or whatever. Now, what I think we have seen, which you know, kind of gets at this a little bit, 
is we've actually seen a lot of law enforcement organizations, a lot of politicians and governments all say like, look, bad people have done bad things on the blockchain, 100%, right? Like we know that's happened. And they've been able to go track those people down and, and kind of bring them to justice, whatever that ended up being. And so it, it almost gets at this question of like, who should be believed by default? Or like who should be given the, the, uh, the default right to continue until something else changes? And it's like, is it the government or is it the individual? And ultimately, as you know, I'm assuming uh, you, you would guess is like, it just comes down to like political perspectives, which is like a weird thing because Bitcoin is technology, it's software, it's like the least political thing from a technical architecture, but it gets almost um, uh, kind of brought into these political discussions because to your point, it allows for people to do things that they previously couldn't have done, which opens up this whole can of worms, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I mean, yeah. So I, I think, um, I think, I think basically, you know, you just have to acknowledge that that it it can be used for things the government doesn't want people to use, and 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 that's 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 part of the 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 value of it. But but yeah, I mean, whether that's whether that's good or bad, I guess also depends on you know how how good you think governments are at being the arbiter of of right and wrong. I mean, yeah, these are right. Sort of philosophical questions, <laughs> um, but uh, yeah. So okay, maybe a couple other things too. Um, so I think you've also mentioned before that like uh, bank failures and maybe like the potential for confiscation, like what happened in Cyprus, is a good reason for people to hold Bitcoin. Is do I have that right? I, I think it's less about like, hey, that's a reason everyone should go out and you know buy Bitcoin. I think it's more so um, the idea of self custody, similar to the central banks, right? Uh, the more custody you have, the more sovereignty you have of the assets, it pre it prevents against those edge cases. And they're very much edge cases in the developed world. In the le uh, less developed world, they're probably more common. Uh, and there's also not things like FDIC insurance, et cetera, but it's definitely one of the reasons why sovereignty uh, becomes important in my opinion. Yeah, okay. I guess I think I think maybe we would we would then mostly agree on that. That uh, it, you know in, in the in the developed world it's it's not so much of a concern. Uh, there are, by the way, ways to 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 increase your your FDIC insurance by quite a bit. I mean, you can open up multiple bank accounts. Uh, you can actually add beneficiaries to them. So if you add beneficiaries to a bank account, it actually stacks up the FDIC insurance uh, to to up to uh, 1.25 million. Um, so so yeah, I mean, I I think that. The, the number of people who would actually need to to start thinking about buying Bitcoin because they like run out of banks to open, you know, to deposit their money at, I think is, is, it's got to be vanishingly, uh, vanishingly small. Um, so another, another thing, and maybe we'll, we'll disagree a bit more on this, is I'm actually not necessarily convinced that cryptocurrency is currency. Um, I mean, it's obviously the term that people call it, and so I, I use it. But I don't think that Bitcoin is it, it, it is not a currency. It's not a unit of account. It's not a medium of exchange. Like I, I can't go to the grocery store and hand the Bitcoin for for groceries. Uh, I can't go to the movie theater and and pay Bitcoin to to go watch watch a movie. Uh, Amazon will not accept my Bitcoin for selling me, you know, whatever it is that Amazon sells us everything. Um, so so it it it's more of a niche. Thing. And now I, I do, however, think it is a store of value, um, but but it, it's not it, it's not yet at the level of a currency. Um, now, it, like gold, for example, isn't isn't a currency either. Um, you know, if I none of those places I just told you about will will accept my uh, gold bullion, right? So if I if I bring a bar of gold to the grocery store or whatever, they're, they're not going to accept that. Um, but yeah, I mean, so so I think I think that um, thinking of, of of these things as as I mean, so they're just not yet currencies. Uh, that doesn't mean that they won't ever be. Um, and maybe part of the 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 again part of the sort of the insurance you're you're getting when you buy Bitcoin is that you're kind of protecting yourself against the scenario where somehow the U.S. dollar becomes worthless or something like like there's some major uh either policy screw-ups or like a nuclear war or something 
And in that scenario, maybe cryptocurrencies actually start becoming like a unit of account because like society is sort of broken down or something. Um, but, uh, but, but I don't know, just today, I, I just, I, I don't see it. So I, I have two things that kind of jump to mind. Uh, the first is I'm going to throw out a like definition of a currency and you tell me if this is aligned with yours. Uh, I heard you say a okay. couple of things. So I'm assuming it's like store value, medium of exchange and unit of account would be the three yeah, that's things. The right? tr yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I, I would agree with that. And I think that's like a, a good um, framework. And, and my guess is that most people who are uh, quote unquote currency experts would, would say, Hey, yes, that checks the boxes uh, of that. Now where uh, I may question some of those currency experts is a lot of times when I hear people talk about is something a currency or is it not? Obviously, given what I do on a day-to-day -day basis, a lot of time they're talking about Bitcoin. Um, but there are other assets that you 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 know you mentioned gold and, and others that can kind of come under this scrutiny. Um, one of the things that I, I've started to think about more, and I, I frankly don't have a fully formed opinion, so I'll kind of throw it out there as a uh, maybe a prompt, and, and you can respond to it, is that actually some assets are currencies in one situation, but not currencies in another, and. What it made me think about is like environment matters when evaluating if something's a currency or not. And, and where this came from was uh, I used to use the example of cigarettes inside of a prison. Yeah. And so like, again, kind of extreme example, right? But, but it highlights the point of like, they're used as a store value, they're used as a medium of exchange, and to some degree they're used as like a unit of account, right? It's more of like a barter type system and, and, and they're used. Now, I don't think anyone who uh, wants to be taken seriously in the financial world or in the academic world would go and say, you know, cigarettes are a currency all around the world. And if you got cigarettes, you're good to go. Um, but in that, you know, kind of more insular environment, they do act as a currency. And so if you take that and kind of extrapolate it out to Bitcoin, it's unique in that uh, I think most people who hold Bitcoin um, and even people who don't but, but uh, uh, kind of evaluate it, they would agree, yes, Bitcoin serves as a store of value. Now, whether it's a good one or bad one, that's debated. You know, free market kind of determines price and it changes or, and fluctuates. But store of value, I think most people are like, okay, you know, I, I can see that. When it comes to the medium of exchange and the unit of account, that's where I think, you know, you're highlighting, hey, look, this is not widespread. This is not global. And so if you use that, like, well, what environment are you talking about? In a physical environment, if you go to, you know, Bitcoin Beach, there's a lot of people who are using it for transactions. Things are priced in Bitcoin. But I don't know, maybe there's a couple hundred, maybe, you know, single digit thousands of people in that one insular economy that are using it. Again, does that make it a currency on a global scale? Does that mean that it's just within that insular economy? Is that the first data point on a, tr you know, upward trajectory of adoption globally? All up for debate. But, but at least in that insular thing, it's being used as a currency. Um, but I would agree with you on a global basis, it is not unit of account. There has not been, you know, this hyper Bitcoinization idea, uh, all, all of those types of things. And so like, you know, the, the prompt that I, I would almost kind of want to hear your thoughts on is like, how do folks who look at these currencies think about, you know, global uh, evaluation versus more of like these insular economies? And can something almost serve, you know, to some people as a currency and to other people, it's actually not a currency, like, like they actively are on the other side of that debate. How does that work? Hey guys, I hope that you're enjoying this conversation. As you probably realize, we don't run any ads on this show. That's right. All the other podcasts, all the other YouTube shows that you watch, they have advertisers. We don't have any direct relationships with advertisers, and we simply create this because we enjoy doing it. Now that we do that, though, we have a team. And if you'd like to support us, one way you can do that is to go subscribe to the Pomp Letter. It's a daily letter that I write to about 235,000 people about my personal opinion on financial markets, business, technology, and Bitcoin. Just go to pompletter.com and you can sign up there. I'd love to have you join us and it's a great, easy way to support the work that the team and I are doing on a daily basis. All right, let's get back into this conversation. Yeah, that, that actually is an interesting question because, uh, for example, um, the things that I just described uh like going to the grocery store or the movie theater or whatever if i'm doing that in the united states and i brought um, a euro banknote uh to, to the grocery store or the movie theater they wouldn't take that either so in in that setting it it's not uh, the euro banknote is not acting as a currency even though of course uh we we would uh generally recognize the euro to be a currency and, and certainly anywhere in the european union and, and many countries besides that uh, it, it would be accepted uh, for for those kinds of transactions. So, um, yeah, I mean, I guess so. That there is there is a, a inherently a sort of um, 
like a time, place, and manner type uh, mm -hmm. uh, 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 notion to, to, to the concept of, of a currency. But, but still, um, I, I think that it's got to be more, a lot more widespread than, than Bitcoin currently is. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, and I think to your point, it's like, um, you know, one of the things I've always said is like, if Bitcoin becomes a store of value, it does not necessarily, um, achieve what is written in the white paper, right? Electronic peer to peer cash. Like, like it's very much intended right. to be both a store of value, medium of exchange. And then eventually that would lead to the unit of account. But at the same time, if it became the global store of value that was used by billions of people, like that would be a pretty big success. Right. So, so just that alone would kind of uh, um, I think a lot, a lot of people would point to and say, hey, Bitcoin worked for that specific use case. Now, obviously, people in the Bitcoin community believe that it is going to become the medium of exchange and that unit of account. And so the other thing I always laugh about, it, it was kind of like um, with the inflation talk in the United States. They're like, you know, it's transitory. It's not transitory. I used to always say like, well, what, what makes the, like, where's the line, right? If it's only here for six months, is that transitory? But if it's here for seven, then it wasn't transitory. You know, it's kind of like this, like very arbitrary, loose definition that's used. And so the same thing with like medium of exchange, right? As I almost think about like, if a hundred million people used it for everyday transactions, is that enough? Well, there's like, you know, seven and a half, eight billion people, whatever it is in the world, like, <laughs> uh, you know, we're, we're not even really at like, you know, 10%. Does it have to be a billion? Like, like, where's the line? And a friend of mine uh, said to me, he goes, nah, it's more of like a, you know it when you see it thing. And I think that's kind of how people feel a little bit is like, okay, I, I feel like it's a store of value for enough people where like, I'll buy that. I don't know enough people who use it on a day-to-day -day basis. So like, I kind of don't believe that story yet. And then I, when I go to the store, I don't see it priced in Bitcoin. So like, I don't believe the unit of account. Um, but I don't know, maybe like there are definitions of this stuff that like, you know, the, the Bitcoin community just hasn't talked about yet. It, it, it's like a very fascinating thing that um, in some way, the Bitcoin community and myself personally, like we've gotten a crash course in economics, the banking system, like currencies, like all this stuff. And I always wonder like how much of it is we're learning versus like we're trying to recreate the wheel. And like we maybe should just like learn from history a little bit at, at, at the same time. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, I, I certainly don't know off the top of my head of any kind of like specific definition as far as let's say how many people have to use something in order for it to be uh, considered a currency. Um, you know, I, I guess I just go back to the you know, beauties in the eye of the beholder, right? Yes. <laughs> so um, on the other hand, the one thing I will, I do want to respond to uh, in, in um, that you just had mentioned is like talking about millions of people using it. Um, you know, my, my paper actually kind of gets really is, is thinking more like, you know, like a hundred institutions or something, right? Like, or maybe no more than 150 or something. Um, and so like in terms of, of Bitcoin becoming used as a, a unit of account or medium of exchange, you know, I, I think actually those are quite, quite separable from, from being a store of value and, and what, and, and the store of value doesn't necessarily imply the other two at all. I mean, again, go back to the example of gold. I mean, people have been using gold as a store of value for uh, thousands of years, but um, it's been quite some time since it's been thought of as, as uh, a unit of account or a medium of exchange. So, yeah. Yeah. I, look, I, I completely agree. And, I, and again, it goes back to this idea of like Bitcoin layer one, right? Kind of the, the, the uh, core blockchain um, is very much built for security. Right. I don't think anyone would look at a blockchain that has 10 minute settlement times uh, and they would say, like, obviously, that is optimized for global adoption to be used as a medium of exchange. And so that's where yeah. the Bitcoin community is trying to build the scaling technologies of lightning and, and you know, kind of all, all of that stuff. Um, and, you know, I would argue that, like, so far it looks pretty good. But I do think that there's a lot of things that, that um, you know, still need to be built out. And also, I think the critique being okay, I theoretically understand what you're trying to do, but like prove it, show me the adoption. It's very similar to like a venture capitalist showing up to a company and saying like, this is a beautiful deck, but like show me the users, <laughs> show me the retention, show me the growth, right? And, and I think that's kind of like the market will ultimately be the referee a little bit in terms of uh, how far along the like Bitcoin vision do we get um, and obviously that's where markets get made because the Bitcoin community, uh, is very, very, you know, optimistic and, and, and uh, enthusiastic. 
And then I think critics are saying, you know, the, I don't see a path from where we are today to, to that vision. And we'll kind of see what happens. The, the only thing I hope for is, you know, it happens in our lifetimes. Right, like I, I want an answer before I die. Is like the way that I've, I've now come to the conclusion. This isn't a twelve month exercise. It's probably a couple decades. And so, like, let's see where it kind of goes. Um, but I don't know. What 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 is your kind of maybe we'll we'll end here in, in terms of like what what are your thoughts in terms of uh, the biggest milestones? Like like I take you as somebody who maybe is um, cautiously optimistic. Is maybe where I would kind of characterize your your view of uh, Bitcoin optimistic being like you see some use cases like the insurance for central banks, but like cautious in terms of the, the critiques of it's not a medium of exchange. It's not a currency, things like that. Is that like maybe a fair kind of bucket to put you in if, if you would allow me to put you in a bucket? Um, yeah. And I would also just say, I don't think it's for everyone. So, so like, you know, if, if you're living in a developed country and you have no real reason to believe that, you know, your assets are likely to be confiscated or that, um, you know, you, you're, you're in a situation where, where, uh, you know, the government's going to pursue like civil asset forfeiture or something against you, then, then I think the argument for you to, to buy Bitcoin, certainly buy a lot of Bitcoin is, is very tenuous. Um, like, like there's just, you know, you, because again, it's like you're not getting an insurance benefit out of it. So if all you're doing is just speculating, that's that's probably not a uh, a game you want to be playing um, for for the vast majority of people. So so yeah, so I think I think there are absolutely some use cases uh, for for some people, but it's it's not it's not for everybody. Um, what would change my mind a lot on that uh, would be if it became a lot less volatile. So. If if the if the price volatility really came down, um, then you know then it might actually because then it's almost like you have your cake and you just you get this insurance value and it's also sort of the stable you know thing where you don't have to uh, worry about it dropping you know seventy five percent in one year like it did last year. Um, so yeah, I, I, did, I, I so I think I think uh, I think you 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 had me. Uh, mostly uh, pegged <laughs> correctly. <laughs> so the, the the volatility question is actually uh, pretty interesting. I, I want to throw an idea out there, and um, I, I'm going to uh, allow myself to uh, say, Department of Economics, Harvard. You probably are are uh, much better versed in this than I am. But um, fr from kind of a layman's view of this, one one of the questions around volatility that I struggle with, uh, one articulating, but also two even just understanding. Is that like it's very clear Bitcoin's volatility because we use the dollar exchange price, right? So I will take one Bitcoin today. Someone will buy it for seventeen thousand three hundred dollars. Uh, two weeks ago they would buy it for fifteen, and a year ago they were buying it for sixty nine thousand dollars, or you know whatever the numbers were. So obviously that exchange price is super volatile. When I think of dollars, no one really thinks of them as volatile because. I get paid in dollars, I save in dollars, I buy all my goods and services in dollars, I pay my taxes in dollars, like everything around me is denominated in dollars. But if I was to pull back and look at like the purchasing power, obviously with you know the official inflation numbers compounding at over 7% for multiple years, you're like, okay, yeah. I don't know, you know, 12 to 20% inflation over, let's call it the, the pandemic era or whatever, depending on kind of what numbers you want to believe. But we don't think of dollars as volatile. Right, because it's like one dollar buys you one dollar worth of goods. It's just the amount of goods has changed. How do you think about, or, or maybe if you were even me, like talking about Bitcoin volatility compared to like dollar volatility, or do you think that they're just apples and oranges, and it's like unfair to try to compare them? Well, I mean that's that's kind of uh, the concept of a real exchange rate, right? Sort of like how much um, how much does a currency uh, move around in terms of the uh, the the amount of consumption that that it buys you. Uh, and in terms of a dollar, yeah, that's that's eroded some uh, because of of uh, uh, inflation, uh, but also uh, just also in terms of uh, it's it's moved around uh, relative to to other currencies. So yeah, I mean, you always have to when you're measuring an exchange rate, you always are measuring it against something, right? You have to measure it against the dollars against euros, dollars against yen, you know, Bitcoin against dollars or whatever. Um, uh, but I think no matter how you measure it, you know, Bitcoin against X, you know, whatever X is, I think uh, you're going to find that that's very volatile in terms of 
whether you measure it in terms of just the X itself, or you then take the step further and measure it in terms of units of consumption. Um, so, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, the, the the one other thing I would say about this that. Um, Again, it kind of adds a complexity to, to the analysis. And, and sometimes I wonder if we're just like intellectually stimulating ourselves because we're all bored and have nothing else to d discuss. Um, but if you think of uh, the day-to-day -day volatility, it, it would be very hard for anyone to argue that Bitcoin does not go up and down in value at a much rapid rate compared to the US dollar, right? I, I think that's pretty clear. But if you were to look over, again, let's go back to kind of 2020 to now, I'll call it the pandemic era, if you will. Um, the dollar is down whatever that number is, right? Whether it's on the lower end of 10 or maybe on the upper end of 20, it's down some double digit percentage. Um, Bitcoin has gone up and down and up and down. And it's been like, you know, just whipped around, but it's up 200% from where it started 2020, right? So kind of over that three year period, it's up kind of 200% or so. And so the way that I, I, I think about this is like on one hand, uh, with dollar denomination, assets and goods and services have gotten more expensive over that three year period. But if you had the Bitcoin denomination, things have gotten cut in half in, in terms of like your purchasing power and, and your ability to buy goods and services. I don't think many people are picking their day-to-day -day currency based on a three or you know even five or 10 year time horizon. I think it's more that store of value as you mentioned earlier. But how would you kind of think through that or and maybe you even done some work on it of like in the short term, something super volatile compared to a more stable asset like the dollar but in the long term, it seems to actually have a better store of value and, and kind of almost have this tailwind for people who hold it that then want to consume using it. Um, yeah, so I, I think that uh, uh, I think you have to be careful when, when you're when you're conducting an analysis like this, because it's going to matter greatly where you choose the starting point and the ending point. Right. So, uh, I mean, as you pointed out, you know, one way of looking at Bitcoin is that you're up 200 percent over the last. What, like three years? Did you say three years or since 2020 just, or something? No. Yeah. Another way of looking at it is you're down 75 percent last year. <laughs> Correct. So, yeah. So, so the it shorter matters the timeline, the more the pain. I think of like the shorter the timeline, the more the pain. The longer the timeline, the more it looks good for you know the Bitcoin uh, holder, if you will. Yeah. I. I. But I do. I do think that uh, Bitcoin holders have got to expect even over longer time frames that the returns are not going to be as high as they have mm -hmm. been. Um, I mean, I think the, the early adopters of Bitcoin, I mean, if you bought Bitcoin in like 2010 or something, like, you know, clearly no, you've, you've I done wish. super, yeah, yeah, clearly you've done super, super well. Um, I actually remember taking a course on cryptography as an undergrad where people brought up Bitcoin like as an interesting, like academic curiosity almost. And I think it was like $10 or something back then. So yeah, I kind of wish I had, <laughs> <laughs> I wish I knew you and was in that class. <laughs> yeah. But uh uh um you know, in order for like like there's just there's just no like economic rationale for why over say a 10 then like the next 10 years bitcoin should return, you know, thousands of percent. I mean, it's just like I I I just struggle to come up with any kind of plausible um, reason for, for why that ought to be the case. I mean, if it's, if it's going to act as a store of value and sort of a real asset, then the rate of return ought to be much closer to the rate of inflation. And, um, you know, I, I think that that's, if you're going to buy Bitcoin, that, that ought to be uh, your, closer to your, your expectation than uh you know the kinds of fantastic returns that people got when bitcoin and, and you know back then it was also it was a riskier thing i mean people had no idea whether it was going to work out i mean it you know it could have had maybe someone could have successfully attacked it or found bugs in the in the protocol right i mean like there are all kinds of risks that are related to the early adoption of a cryptocurrency that have i think nowadays been more or less settled that you know we know that this thing is fairly secure and, and robust because uh, there, there certainly are enough people using it today and that have you know kind of looked at the code and everything and, and made sure that, that everything checks out. Um, but back when, when it got started, I mean, I, I don't think that that was necessarily the case. So, you know, the early adopters got some, some risk premium for that. And, uh, but, but there's no, there's just no reason why uh, it, it's going to keep producing these kinds of tremendous returns. So I, I think, 
yeah, you got to expect inflation, maybe inflation plus one, inflation plus two, or something. But you know that that's that's probably the long the long run for for Bitcoin. Yeah, I, I actually agree with you. I I, I don't think that. Um you will continue to see, like I call it like video game number returns, right? I think at some point yeah. those taper off. Um, and yes, everyone loves the stories of hundreds or thousands of percent, you know, tens of thousands of percent. Um, but, but I think you nailed it in that, like you get paid for the risk you take. And now Bitcoin has been drastically de-risked in a number of different vectors. There's still, you know, plenty of people who have certain risks or, or, or concerns or whatever, but, but many of the major risks have been uh, at least mitigated, if not completely uh, removed. And so you should expect the return to go down. Um, but the other thing too, uh, and, and again, maybe this kind of gets at the, the dollar Bitcoin thing, is I don't know if they necessarily are competitive on a, a short to medium uh, time horizon. And so, like, I think that the Bitcoin community does a great job of, like, pointing, you know, a century away. And they're like, look what's going to happen 100 years from now. Maybe. Right. I don't I don't think I'll be alive for that. But I do think that in the next, you know, I don't know, let's just say 10 or 20 years, like the U.S. dollar likely will continue to uh, strengthen against other fiat currencies and kind of become, you know, at least uh, hold its position, if not become more dominant against weaker currencies. Uh, and that will continue to be used as a day to day medium of exchange. But Bitcoin, maybe it just continues to gain steam as a store of value, right? And, and uh, it kind of has this rise with the dollar and, and they coexist for quite a bit. Um, and that can be separate and distinct from what happens in the long run, right? Like, like to me, it's not a, uh, just because they're structurally set up some way, you don't necessarily have to conclude that the end game is what happens, you know, even in our lifetime, let alone in the next 10 or 20 years, um, which is unique because then it kind of, again, if you unpack it, the dollar is designed to lose a little bit of value through inflation every year to spur the economic activity and, and kind of all the things that uh, uh, people understand. Bitcoin is almost engineered in a way that although it'll have short-term volatility in the long run to kind of continue to gain some purchasing power just because it's a finite asset and as more people adopt it, it should go up in that purchasing power terms. Um, but I think as you kind of started the conversation, like, we, we don't know for sure, right? Like, like it is, uh, these questions are worth asking because ultimately the market will kind of determine it, but um, we, we need to kind of understand what we're, what the risks are and what the potential pros are and we go from there. Yeah, I mean, I, so I'm not actually not necessarily sure that over a 10 or 20 year period, the dollar will appreciate or, or depreciate. I mean, that's also going to spend a great deal on the course of monetary policy in, in the US compared to the, the rest of the world, um, and then whether the U.S. dollar continues to gain traction as as a you know sort of a medium of exchange or unit of account in, in international trade, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I think you know the countries like uh, like China, for example, has has been very insistent and and interested in trying to peel countries away from dealing in U.S. dollars to dealing in in well probably to prefer renminbi, but if not that, then at least something else. <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, I, I, I actually think we're probably headed more towards a sort of a multipolar international financial system where you know, the dollar maybe is a plurality, but it's not going to be like the dominant majority force like like it has been. Um, and I think that Bitcoin may be one of the smaller things that's part of that, and maybe it's just used as a store of value. Um, but, but yeah, and, you know, actually, so as far as like the long run in Bitcoin, the last Bitcoin will be mined, what, in, in like 2136, 2140, um, 2140, something like that. I think. Yeah. Yeah. So, so certainly, um, you know, it'd be interesting to, to know what'll happen, uh, with, with Bitcoin after that. I mean, like, are the, are the transaction fees going to be enough to, to sustain it? Um, you know, to, to, to incentivize miners to continue, continue mining are people going to be willing to pay fees that are, that are that high i mean that's sort of an interesting question but yeah unfortunately uh, i will be dead by then so <laughs> <laughs> you you and i both will uh we'll we'll, we'll we'll be on our deathbed wondering i wonder what's going to happen and hopefully uh uh, we we unfortunately will never know, Matthew. I I really enjoyed talking. I, uh, this is uh, this is fantastic, and and um, I, I've really appreciated. I think kind of just your critical thinking ar around so many of these topics. If anyone wants to reach out or, or learn more of the work that you're doing, where can we send them to find you on the internet? 
Yeah. Um, so I have a, I have my contact information on a Google site. Um, so if you just Google my name, uh, it'll, it'll come up. Um, and there's also a link there where you can uh, download my, my paper or whatever the current version of it is. I'm working on a, uh, a revision. Um, uh, and, and if you want to read it, I'm always interested in hearing from people who have thoughts and, and uh, feedback on, on my work, on my work. So, yeah. Awesome. And, and for those that um, want to go check out the paper again, it is uh, titled Hedging Sanctions Risk, Cryptocurrency and Central Bank Reserves, uh, published back in, uh, or the original was published in November of 2022. Um, but Matthew, thank you so much. I, I learned a ton today, and I hope that this was valuable for everyone uh, watching and listening. And uh, please uh, kind of keep pushing forward because uh, there's a lot of people, I think, as you realized, once the, once you published the paper, who, uh, who, who are paying attention to this space and, uh, and found your paper valuable as well. So thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for having me on. It was, it was a fun conversation.